I had bet against America and won. In 2010, I pub published an op-ed in the New York Times posing what I thought was a valid question of the Federal Reserve, Congress, and the President. I saw the crisis coming. Why did not the Fed? Never did any member of Congress, any member of government for that matter, reach out to me for an open collegial discussion on what went wrong or what could be done. Rather, within two weeks, all six of my defunct funds were audited. The Congressional Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission demanded all my emails and lists of people with whom I had conversed going back to 2003. And a little later, the FBI showed up. A million in legal and accounting costs and thousands of hours of time wasted, all because I asked questions. Hello, my wise investing friends. I have a real life legend to tell you about today, none other than Michael Burry. Now, this is the guy who spied the monumental 2008 financial crash long before anyone else, scoring himself and his investors a windfall that few others predicted. Burry was the main character in the book, but you may remember this guy from the film of the same name, The Big Short. Christian Bale's excellent portrayal of Burry made him a memorable character. Burry's route to wealth and success has not always been an easy one. I'm going to take you through his life during this video, and we can see how this incredible mind made the big time. Early Life and Childhood Born in New York City in 1971, but raised in sunny San Jose, California. He was born with a rare and severe form of eye cancer, which meant he had an eye removed as a baby. It is said this affected the way people treated him, but became a core part of his personal narrative, meaning he found dealing with others quite hard. Many would say he is introverted, preferring to spend time on his own interests, which came to serve him very well in later years, as we will see in this video. His youth was mainly focused on medical studies along with economics. He did his pre-med at the University of California, Los Angeles. Following this was medical school. He got his MD at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. There was a neurology residency at Stanford Hospital and Clinics, but this is where his medical career ended. Burry had found a new calling. During his time studying, after the long days had ended, he had a secret hobby, writing about trading online. This was during the dot-com boom and Burry saw a lucrative opportunity by investing in companies. At the time, this was quite a rogue idea, thus making Burry an oddity once again. With his incredible intelligence and brilliant mind, it was no time at all before Burry had learned all there was from online forums. It was time for something new. He started a blog, not in the way we see them today, showing off his backpacking trip through Europe or 100 ways to make a cupcake. This was a serious financial blog for people with a serious interest in finance. At the turn of the millennia, Burry decided enough was enough and threw the towel in on his medical career, needing to focus solely on investments. Perhaps unsurprisingly, in his later life, he was diagnosed with Asperger syndrome. Burry started his own company and called it Scion Asset Management, the name coming from the Scions of Shannara by Terry Brooks. Running his own company unfortunately meant a lot of face-to-face -face conversations with other humans. Burry was known to find this the most uncomfortable aspect to his new venture and preferred letters to update on progress. He has said in the past that he has never felt included in a group situation, never comfortable or content. As if looking in on the room from afar, Burry liked to analyze people and the dynamics. I'm sure many of us can relate to this. It's true that most of those interested in finance are socially awkward people. This is why we would rather make friends with money than people. I'm going to take a quick break here to shout out to all of you guys for watching the videos. We love this community and we are so grateful to all of you. If you are new here, then stick around, hit the subscribe button and let's grow the family. It would also mean so much to me if you gave this video a like too. A big huge thank you to all my subscribers. You guys are great. Back to Burry. You remember earlier that we mentioned Burry's blog created as his passion and interest for finance flourished. He liked to update on market performance and discuss his views on various types of investment. In no time at all, some big hitters caught wind of his page. Burry was contacted by Benjamin Graham, who led a high net worth fund. With Graham's guidance, Burry was able to increase his personal success tenfold. He was able to pick out undervalued stocks from the internet and begin investing in them using his company, Scion Capital. At the start, Burry had kickstarted his company using personal loans and extending the mortgage on his house. That's insane, right? I bet many of us can relate to this. 
This proves simply how much conviction Burry's had in his own knowledge and market predictions. One day, in the early weeks of setting the Scion office up and running, a man called Joel Greenblatt called to speak to Burry. Unbeknownst to Burry, Joel had been following his career. He had been waiting for Burry to end his medical career and invited him and his wife to New York. Joel was the founder of the investment fund Gotham Capital and the author of the book, You Can Be a Stock Market Genius. Well worth a read if you have time. Initially, the meeting in New York was well out of Burry's comfort zone. A face-to-face -face meeting as well as a ton of pressure that even the calmest of characters would balk at. Luckily for Burry, his fears were unfounded. Almost immediately into the meeting, Burry was offered $1 million to buy into Scion Capital, an offer that a gobsmacked Burry willingly accepted. And can you really blame him? What would you have done? Apparently, Gotham wasn't the only group to recognize a genius at work as an insurance holding company named White Mountain contacted Burry shortly after this. Similarly to Gotham Capital, this was an unusual move for a company of this stature. The manager of the fund was called Jack Byrne, who happened to be chummy with a friend of this channel, Warren Buffett. Byrne had caught wind of the deal with Gotham and wanted his slice of the pie too. Following a discussion with Burry, White Mountain bought into co-ownership for $600,000, with a tasty $10 million on the top to use for investment. Burry no longer had to mortgage his own home for liquidity. In just a year, Scion Capital made huge profits and they continued on the success trail for the next few years. So much so that at the end of 2004, Scion Capital had $600 million AUM, which let me tell you is jaw-dropping, astounding and stupendously marvelous by industry standards. Burry's style was different to most. Predominantly, this is because his company had its investors at the forefront, not personal profit. His principles have always been very firm, which I think is a big reason for his success. Burry has described his style as ick investing. Before you ask, no, we are talking about when your date's shoelaces are tied too tight and any hope of fancying them sails straight out the window. This is how Burry describes it. Ick investing means taking a special analytical interest in stocks that inspire a first reaction of ick. Now, let's put that in English. Burry would find undervalued investments that initially appeared not great long term, though they worked out brilliantly good value. In normal circumstances, investments of this caliber would often depreciate as the market sold off, then go up dramatically soon after as the issues calmed down and the value was noted. This approach of ick investing took Scion to a new level and bound the company into fame in the very public eye. Next on the agenda would be what's called credit default swaps. We will call them CDSs, which is basically an insurance on a loan. CDSs were first created in the mid-1990s but weren't common at the time. The upshot to the holder is that if the loan goes belly up, the person who holds the CDS would get paid. Usually, they are commandeered by loan holders to hedge a risk or sometimes by a savvy investor who has an inkling that a loan will go bad. Burry was a savvy investor and by the summer of 2005, he had $750 million worth of CDSs sat in his fund. A normal hedge fund, this was not. At the peak of his career, Michael Burry turned his focus onto the subprime market. He started analyzing practices in the market in the early 2000s. Burry noticed big problems that he predicted would lead to huge instability. He worked out early on that the real estate bubble would burst as soon as 2007. He saw how risky the subprime market was as millions of people would borrow money while having low income and very few assets. They bought cars and homes with huge leverage. Some of these people made no down payment at all for a mortgage they would not have a hope in paying if rates rose by even a small amount. This was entertainingly depicted in the movie version of The Big Short, where it turned out that even exotic dancers had been able to take out mortgages to purchase multiple properties. If you thought this was funny, make sure you subscribe to our channel right now. The big killer was that the banking system was valued as if these loans were guaranteed to be paid. Burry surmised that this simply could not last over a long period and worked out how his clients could survive financially and even profit from a disaster of this magnitude. He was open with his investors and told them of the enormous risks that were built into the system. Most of these investors were large companies and institutions that were not interested in this radical way of looking at things. All their investments were made upon the idea that the system was strong and reliable. Burry's investors became nervous and demanded their money back. Too late, however, as Burry had made many long-term bets against the market that the prices of mortgages would eventually fall. Cashing out of those trades now would mean suffering detrimental losses. Aside from this, Burry was steadfast in his belief. 
Burry refused the investors' requests. Fortunately for Burry, by early 2007, his predictions were becoming a reality. In the initial period of a loan, a subprime mortgage would offer a teaser rate, which are low payments early in the mortgage. In the first few months of this year were when these rates started to end. Those low payments were now skyrocketing, causing many to default on their loans. At this time, Burry was seriously struggling. To keep his position, he had to let go of some of his staff and, importantly, some of his positions. Meaning, the CDSs we talked about earlier were significant because as investments, these were sure as hell to pay off. Selling these meant eating into the profit that would have arrived when they paid off. Only a few months later, Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs were coming apart at the seams in front of the whole world. Burry started contacting people. There were lots of convenient power cuts, sick days, and other excuses. When late June came around, they were conferring with Burry to mark their CDS's value. Their own reports had been underestimating them. By July, more reports were surfacing from those who similarly predicted the fall of subprime investments, including one from Greg Lippmann, a trader from Deutsche Bank. Lippmann was the person who reinitiated contact with Burry, having copied his plan and made money from doing so. Unsurprisingly, with hindsight, Burry was bang on the money, excuse the pun. He made a personal profit of a staggering $100 million and a further $700 million for his investors. The windfall saw Scion Capital generating a 489.33% return, managing $1 billion at his peak. Burry has said that no one believed he would be one of the most successful investors of all time, and despite not receiving the recognition he really deserved, he has still done exceptionally well, as did his clients. If we look at profit only, a client who stuck with Burry's plan would have made 500% return on their money. Burry didn't get any thank yous for his hard work or sorries for the doubt and accusations his investors had made. It is no surprise that Burry didn't like people. In fact, instead of recognition, he was somewhat pointlessly investigated by the FBI at the time. His life outside finance is very different to the high-stress environment he is in day to day. He lives with his wife and children in Saratoga, California. His son has been similarly diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome. Burry avoids the spotlight in public eye. He now works as a financial specialist and has returned to his medical roots as a physician. He did end up gaining fame following the book written by financial journalist Michael Lewis and subsequent film about the subprime bubble that we know as The Big Short. The great lesson in this story, stick to your morals, be firm with your intuition, and perhaps we can all get a taste of Burry's success. And more importantly, always read the small print. As it says at the end of the film, Burry is now investing all his money into one commodity, water. Though he has dabbled with gold and farmland, he has been noted to say fresh, clean water cannot be taken for granted, and it is not. Water is political and litigious. One thing we all know can protect water is sustainable fashion. Check out clothes.com, the world's best suitable fashion store on the internet. This site has a great array of wardrobe essentials that do not cost the planet or your wallet. Check it out now to upgrade your wardrobe. In recent years, Burry has also initiated short positions on Tesla, according to a now-deleted tweet after the market cap of the company surpassed that of Facebook. He predicts Tesla stock will collapse in the same way the housing bubble did. He said somewhat boastfully that my last big short got bigger and bigger and bigger and go to Tesla investors to enjoy it while it lasts. He currently has 800,001 shares of Tesla. No longer an active hedge fund investor, his wealth is still more than many can dream of. He has set a precedent that will outlast his lifetime. Unconfirmed sources place his current net worth to be in the region of 200 to 300 million dollars. One thing is for sure, Michael Burry saved many people from complete financial ruin. That is a very serious legacy. What a legend. We challenge you to name even one investor who has come close to the success of Michael Burry. Seriously, let us know in the comments below and we may just make our next video about them. In the meantime, make sure you like this video and subscribe to our channel right now. The number one finance channel on the line. Seriously, latest studies have shown that subscribing to this channel makes you much more likely to succeed in your personal financial plans.